Good morning. Sterling March here, and you are tuned in to Kingdom Road with yours truly. Well, yes, this is Monday morning. I couldn't record yesterday because the power I had a power cut. Because I'm sure some of you saw in my communication today, I had a power cut. So I couldn't record and it was off for more than five, four hours so I decided you know what I would just put it off until today but hey what is the saying there's no time like the present <laughs> okay so we're gonna do this now we got a great and awesome topic for you today and it is God was is and will always be in control yeah I know that's a statement that we make a lot I know we make that statement a lot, but I wonder if we really understand that. Because if we did, we believers would start fretting, we'd start worrying. Do you know how significant that statement is? He is always in control. The God you say you love, who says he loves you, is in full control of your existence, but you still worry. Hmm. Even after he said, all things work together for good to them that love me. Even after he said, um, oh gee, uh, tests and trials come to make you stronger. Even after he said, take no thought to the future, for the future will take care of itself. Meaning he's in the future, waiting to take care of you. Even after he said, the weapon may form, but it shall not prosper. He can say all of these things because he's in control of them. It sure ain't Satan who wants you to prosper. It isn't Satan that will send tests and trials to make you stronger. It isn't Satan that promises that if you seek him, come after him, put him first, that he will take care of your all your needs. Now, if he can do all of that, even Satan himself, he says, he will bind him for a thousand years and then release him. And then he says, there's no temptation unto men that is not common unto men. Meaning, what you're experiencing, all men are experiencing. And he said he shall not allow you to have more than you can bear. So that means he's in control of the tempter. Remember Job? Satan asked God for permission to trouble Job. And Job gave, God gave him permission. Listen. God is, yes, truly in control. Stop fretting. Stop worrying. He allows us to go through tough stuff sometimes so that it can make us better. Of course, sometimes we need some chaffing. The Bible says God chastises us with sons, meaning he chastises you because you are his son. And he says, I don't chastise you, you are not a son. He chastises those he loves. So he only chastises for you, chastises you, so that you can be better. He's in control. Always in control. And we must understand and rem always remember that when he does things in this Bible. He's not attempting anything. God never attempts things. He does exactly what he wants to do. And the outcome is what he wants. After all, he already knew what the outcome would be before he even did what he did. And he still did it, right? Listen, man, our God is beyond powerful. Power is, there's it, it, not even a good word to describe who he is. That's something that we have, that he gives to us. But him, come on, man. He, he, he is just too amazing to, to even consider, to fathom. And there's nothing that happens to you that he is not aware of. And can't stop if he wanted to. 
it doesn't matter what it is, even death, the Bible says, he, take, he gives life and he takes it away. Your only concern is that you be sure that you are in his will. That's all. And he says, for those who are in my will, I will take care of them. And sometimes that may mean that he may have to take you out. Because you're in a situation that he knows that you can't get out of. And that it's best for you to leave this earth. The Bible tells us that he, he the Bible says he, he, he takes away his people from the earth to escape them from the calamity to come. To remove them from something that they cannot handle. And while they are in their faith, he before they get their faith is broken, he removes them from the earth. This is in the word. And that's good because when you wake up, you will wake up in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And there's no better place to be than that. So, God was, is, and will always be in control. Keep, just remember that as I teach. Okay? This is the school. And I'm going to take you to class today. And class is starting on time today. Don't forget to share. I need you to always share. Okay, and don't forget I have a CD that's available for those who like good music, good gospel music. This is my CD. You can find it on all the social media sites, Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, uh, Apple TV, Apple Music. Okay, you can find it on all of those. And um, so, like I say, share, please, share, please, share. Okay, so let's go right into it. Classes in session. One of the most important, direct, and applicable statements in the Bible is this. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. In contemplating God and His Word, we must always remember four essential things about Him. One, He does things based upon what He knows. And He knows everything. We don't. We must never consider His words or actions utilizing human understanding. Listen, we try to... construct our thoughts to be so that they can be logical to us and to the people we speak them to. So God is not always logical by human understanding. Everything he does is not understandable. He says his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. As high as the heavens are from the earth, that's how far his thoughts are from us. The only way we can know what God is up to is if he tells us. And that's how we must always think when we're thinking about what God is doing. Let, look for what he says. Don't jump to conclusions. Look for what he says. His Holy Spirit will help you to understand what he says. In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Verse 9, as I said, for as the high heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So don't say, he didn't mean that. That's not what he's doing. Wait, 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 wait. Study. Have relationship with him. Let him tell you. Because the things that I know and that I teach is what God told me. I didn't know these things. I had no idea of these things just some years ago. But as I study and I spend more and more time with him, he began to tell me things and explain things that I didn't understand. And, you know, I began to realize that this Bible is just one big connected book. Everything in this book is connected. Everything. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, it's all connected together. He doesn't say things at random. And he doesn't do things that he hasn't done before. 
everything that God does in the Bible, he did before in Genesis. Everything, all the major moves of God happened in Genesis. And he just repeats them after that. So, number two. Only what he says about himself can be used as knowledge toward who he is. I just said that. And only by his word and his spirit can we receive and understand that knowledge. Listen, he says we must study. But also that the reading of the Bible alone is not enough. Relationship is more important because through it we get understanding of what it is we study. Listen, don't forget. Moses, David, Elijah, Isaiah, Micah, Daniel, Samuel, these guys had no Bible. They had no Bible. But they all had relationship with God. And he would let his Holy Spirit speak to them from time to time. They didn't have the Holy Spirit living in them. Because Jesus had to go to the cross for that to happen. But the Holy Spirit would visit with them. And give them revelation. And in many cases they had manuscripts written by those before them. Moses had the manuscripts of Adam. He didn't have the Holy Spirit living in him Adam wrote down what happened to him and that was passed down so that so that Moses could write the Pentateuch the first five books of the Bible number three we must trust his revelations even when we don't comprehend them I told you everything we will not we will not understand but we got to trust it it is his responsibility to make it clear to us wait on him Listen, some things are just not to be understood that God does. And sometimes he does it intentionally, you know, he's, he's testing your faith. So because some things you just got to accept and believe that it is what God wants and, and accept that that's, that's what you should do. Because he says that's what you should do. Even if you don't understand it and it doesn't make sense, you... You do it because you trust Him. And that's how you go to the next level. And many sees you have that kind of faith. Remember what Jesus said? If you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Be, be thou removed and cast into the sea. He's trying to get you to that level of faith where you can do great things. So you got to trust him. Number four. In reading his word, we must never approach with preconceived notions. Listen. This is one of the most dangerous. Many of us, especially in this society, in the Bahamas, grew up in church. Many of us. I don't know. I don't think it's like that a lot nowadays. A lot of people seem to have given up on the church environment. But I grew up, I was born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s, and even, our, even if our parents didn't go to church, they made sure we went. My dad didn't go to church in the early days. He got saved later, but he didn't go to church. And that was something that perturbed me, man. You know, I, I struggled with that. You know, here it is, you, you cutting my skin <laughs> to go to church, but I don't want to go. And, and, and you don't go? I couldn't get, I couldn't understand that. But I understand it now. And I, I give thanks for that early foundation. But he knew it was the right thing to do, and he came to church later. That's amazing. You know. But the point is, a lot of what I learned unfortunately I had to get rid of I had to discard because it was incorrect so when we become adults and we want God and God tries to tell us things 
sometimes. New revelation about what he actually was doing. It is not oftentimes what we were taught it was. But many of us can't receive what he says, what he is saying to us now. We're holding on to what we were taught by our old priests and pastors and, and, and preachers and teachers who were incorrect in many things that they said. Not everything, but some things they told us, fundamental things were incorrect. But we're holding on to those things. And that causes us to not be able to go to the next level. I had to discourage, to discard a lot of things I learned growing up in church. They were grooming me to be a priest. I, listen, I spent a lot of time in church. I was altar boy, you name it. Holy Communion, Holy, Com I grew up in the Catholic Church. And I had to dis discard most of what I learned from that organization. Once God came into my life and started to tell me the truth and what he was doing, I had to get rid of it. So you sometimes, some things that you've learned, you must get rid of too. Okay? Always have an open mind to receive whatever he gives. Do not use personal experience to decide what you should receive from God. Like I say, he's not like us. He doesn't think like us. The wisdom of God is as foolishness to man, the Bible says. Okay. The Bible sometimes presents not what we first believe it does. Like I said, you know, sometimes it, 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 it's not what we think. It takes relationship for you to get the real understanding of what the Bible is telling you. But it takes relationship and deep meditation for understanding, yes. Your relationship with him will determine how much of him you can receive. God will give you as much of him as you can handle. As you receive... What he's giving, what he's revealing to you. And see, this only happens now to people who do real meditation on the word now. This isn't, this isn't people who casually approach the word. If you're just going to church on Sunday and you just reading one or two passages of scripture and then you put your Bible down for the rest of the week and then you pick it back up and you go back to church in the next week, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't you I'm talking about. You're not going to get anything from God like that. The Bible, God tells us that you must study. You must study. He said, seek. And you shall find. But if you're not seeking, you're not going to find. So you might not even know what I'm talking about right now. If you're just listening to me for the first time or casually approaching this word. You won't. This is for those who really get, in, get into the word. Okay? Scripture is a huge divine teaching tool of God towards man. About him. A real life theater, if you will. It doesn't, listen now, this is important. It doesn't decide anything for the individual. Reading or even understanding the Bible is not enough. You hear what I just said? Reading or even understanding it is not enough. It must be applied. You know, if you know, you, you can know this Bible from front to back. And you can understand it too. But if you don't take it as something that you should apply to yourself, to your own life, it can't affect you. It won't help you. It won't, it, won't, it won't benefit you in any way. It only displays what was ordained, you know, and initiated for our existence. But only through careful study can it be discerned, and its lessons must be utilized. I tell you, there are people who know this by... There are people, there are professors who know this Bible so good, probably better than me. But they don't understand, they, and they, they may even understand something that, that what they've been reading, but they're not saved. Because they haven't applied what they've learned and understood to themselves. Just because you understand something don't mean you want it to be a part of you. You still may not, you, some people are angry with God, you know. Some people are literally angry with God for some of the things he did. There are people who always say, well, if God is love, then why does he allow so much death? Well, excuse me. The Bible says he giveth and he taketh away. It's his right. Don't think about God the way you think of your fellow man. God doesn't view life like you. And no man is more important 
to God and the other. The Bible says he's no respect of persons. Yes, you upset because your grandmother was a Christian and she died when you didn't want her to die? Well, you don't know what God is doing. God may have took her home at the perfect time for her. We don't know what God is doing. And there have been people who, who, are, who are, many have died in the thousands and sometimes millions. Listen, God allowed Hitler to kill millions of Jews. You don't think God could have stopped that? Didn't God prophesy that those kinds of things would happen to them in his word? And didn't he himself kill thousands of them in his word? There are many who feel they have it figured out, but Jesus stated in Matthew 7 and 14 that only a few find him, he said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and he is the life. And he said, and few there be that find it. Only a few. Only a few. Of all the millions, perhaps billions of people around the world, only a few find God. God's ultimate desire for man that was that we be like him, holy sons of God. Okay, this is God the Son now. He is the Son of God. And his desire was that we be like him. He, remember, he made us like him. But he wanted his offspring to choose for himself whether he would possess this awesome gift. He made us like him. He made us gods. Psalm 82 Five and seven, he says, you are gods, but you will die like men. Why? Because you don't know that you are God. And you won't come to know the knowledge that I provide for you to know who you are. The Bible says he, he came into the world and shone his light into the darkness. Meaning he, shone, he, he, put, he, he brought his knowledge to men. The light was his knowledge. The darkness is man's ignorance. But, he, but it says that, but the darkness, the ignorance of man, comprehended it not. But only because they won't study him and have a relationship with him so he can teach it to you. He has to do that through his Holy Spirit. You, like I said, you can't just read the Bible and, and understand it. You have to have a relationship. Okay? But like I said, he wanted man to possess, he wanted man to choose for himself whether he would possess the gift of Godship. Thus he manipulated certain events that would take mankind through a process to prove his devotion to godliness. Now we're going to go get into some heavy stuff in a minute. Okay, from the very beginning in the garden, God who knows all things would do things that have created many questions of his motive. Things that make you go Hmm. Such as, number one, since Adam was created with the breath of God, why wasn't Eve also? Hmm. When God, the Bible says, when God created man, he breathed into man, and man became a living soul. But he didn't breathe into Eve. The breath of life that God breathed into the man, Adam, made him a God like him. But he didn't breathe into Eve. She was alive. But she wasn't alive in God. He didn't breathe into the animals. They were alive. But they weren't alive in God. Only Adam. Hmm. Number two. If the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could cause sin and the death of the breath of that same breath of life, in man, so why did God put it there? Remember, I said God knows everything. So before He put that tree there, He knew what was going to happen. He knew it would cause the death of man. 
he knew that Satan would lead Eve into getting a husband to eat the fruit of that tree. He knew, but he still put it there. So if you know that something's going to happen, and yet you still put the thing there that's going to cause it to happen, isn't that your desire? That it would happen that way? If it wasn't your desire for it to happen that way, like I remember I told you a, a, a few minutes ago, God doesn't attempt anything. Everything he does happens, everything that happens from every outcome that happens from things that he does is exactly what he wants. If he wanted a different outcome, knowing that that was going to be the outcome, wouldn't he have done something different so that there would be a different outcome? I didn't confuse you just now. Wait. Let me say it again then. If God knew that man was going to die from eating that fruit, and he didn't want that to happen, if he knew this now, long before he even made the tree, or Adam, if he didn't want man to die, wouldn't he have not put the tree there? If that's not what he wanted, since God doesn't make mistakes? God is infallible. He does not make mistakes. He wanted that to happen. Hmm. Number three. If the word Eden by definition means the presence of God, or a spot where the presence of God is an open door to heaven, why was Satan allowed into the presence of God in the first place? Hmm. Four. How did Satan even know how to cause the death of breath of the breath of life in man? Why was he not stopped? If God didn't want that to happen. Well, I, think I, I told you, I gave you all a million reasons why you should know that God controls Satan. Remember? He asked God for permission to trouble Job. Satan gets permission to do everything he does concerning man. He cannot do anything to man without God's permission. Even as tempting has a limit by God's command and authority. God has only authorized him to do only what he allows him to do. That's in the word. Hmm. Number five. After the death of life in man, why did the Father wait to send Jesus 5,000 years later to give it back to him? Hmm. I mean, couldn't he have gone to the cross? Not, well, not even a cross, because the cross wasn't necessary. And when I say the cross, I'm talking about the actual physical contraption that they used to kill him on. His death was necessary, but he didn't have to do it on a cross. It only happened that way because that was what the Romans did. That's how they used to punish violent criminals. And it was prophesied that it would happen that way. But it didn't that that the cross didn't have any real, real significance, you know. No, because that wasn't that wasn't a, a, an idea of God. That was the Romans methodology for certain punishment. It was just that the death was necessary for us. So, Jesus could have come to earth as a man sooner and died, right? For mankind. And it would have been the same result. So why did God wait all those thousands of years? Hmm. All of these important questions will be answered in this presentation. Okay? We're going to go through all of these. Now, the methodologies of God. When we come to truly understand God, we find that in most things, He's very predictable. God is very predictable. If you study God, you will find that He is very predictable. You see, we, we find God to be a mystery because we don't study and we don't have a relationship with him. 
If God wants you to know things, he'll, listen, God will tell you everything you need to know if you have a relationship with him. Everything concerning your purpose for him, he will tell you. He, nothing he does will be a mystery to you if it's his will that you know. And if it ain't, don't worry about it. A lot of the things that I teach on this channel, on this page, people call me crazy. When I try to teach this stuff to religious people, they look at me like, you are out of your mind. Yeah, well, God just ain't revealed it to you yet. That's all. I spend a lot of time with God. I don't, I, I'm, I'm unemployed. I choose to be because I want to be in this word. And this is all I do. I meditate on the word. I study the word. This is what I spend my day doing, preparing myself for my teaching, studying. And because of it, he has shown me amazing love. I reveal things to me that none of the pastors that I've been taught by have known. Well, they never taught it. So, the fact that he knows all things, is present everywhere at the same time, and has power over everything, since he created all things, should help us to the realization that he is predictable. God doesn't have to change anything he does. He doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. He can, he can do the same thing over and over. Just in different ways, with different people, in different eras. But it's the same thing. Listen, atonement, redemption, forgiveness, um, the Holy Spirit, uh, all of it. happened before in Genesis. What Christ did was not new. I bet that explode your mind. Jesus Christ didn't do nothing new. What he did now, notice what I said, what he did was not new, not who he was. At least the part of him go uh, the part of him allow killing himself. The Bible says no man take his life, but he gave it. That part was not new. God has been killing sacrifices for the atonement and redemption of man from Eden with Adam and Eve. Remember the animal he killed? I clothed them with it, but let me don't get ahead of myself. Okay. Everything he does is because of those characteristics and a, that I just mentioned, that he's present everywhere, has power over, over everything and knows all things. And there's a pattern that he simply repeats, like I said, as done firstly in Genesis. The book of the original examples or end samples of God. This is what he said concerning them. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 to 10. That which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done again. So there is nothing new under the sun. Verse 10, is there anything of which it can be said, see, this is it, is it, it is new? It has already existed for ages which were before us. And I told you, Jesus himself was not new. Jesus was only repeating something that God had been, that he had been doing before he became Jesus on earth. As the word in heaven, that he had been doing himself on the earth from he created it. Like I said, atonement, redemption, forgiveness, godliness, everything was already done. 
If he knows what will happen, this means that he has already been to the future, come back, came back to the beginning to start our existence and then provided the information of how we are to have victory over all that he made. That's why he can tell us all things will work out for your good, because he doesn't fix it. It doesn't matter what you're going through. I don't care how bad the situation is that you're going through right now. Listen to me, believer. You will come through that if you truly believe. Don't doubt him. Because he may cause it to happen a little longer <laughs> to get that doubt out of you. The minute you trust, start trusting him, I guarantee you that trial will be over. That's all he's trying to get you to do. He doesn't want you to stumble. Because if you lose your faith, you lose everything. So he will carry you through until you get it. And then he'll let, let you go. But he says, it'll work out for your good. And listen. And see, like I was saying earlier, if he sees that you're not going to, it's not going to fix you, that you're not going to get corrected, that you may end up losing your faith, he may take you out to save you from hell. He may have to kill you. Yes. What? God doesn't kill people? Really? You remember Moses? The Bible says he was as strong as his youth. But God killed him. The Bible says God recalled him to his fathers because of his transgression. He disobeyed God. Thank God that God don't do things like that now. That way now. We, are, we live under grace now. But God takes people out. Sometimes. Okay. But like I said, he's already been to the future and he came back to the beginning to start our existence. He knows how to do it because he placed the success in our future. That's why you could say you're going, you're going, it's going to work out for you. He already went into tomorrow and commanded it to bless you. As a matter of fact, he's there now waiting for you to get there to, for your blessing. This is what he does. He's in full control. Nothing happened that happens that surprises him. You see, we think that death is the worst that can happen to a human, right? Well, to God, he says, well, if you don't die, how are you going to come to me? Paul says, right now, I am alive in the body and but absent from the Lord he said but I prefer, I would prefer to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord see we think death is the worst death ain't the worst death without him is the worst that can be okay like I said he knows how to do this thing and he plays because he placed victory there for us in the future. And he wants us as children to know how to do it too. So he tells us what to do. It also tells us that he's in full control and could have prevented anything and everything from happening in Eden. Like I said, if he wanted to. Which confirms that all things happen for his pleasure just as he wanted. And I explain all that to you. The death of God and man in Eden was not an accident. God don't make mistakes. It was exactly what God wanted. If he didn't want it, he could have stopped it. Not even stop it. He could have just avoided it. He could have created man in a completely different scenario. Where there was no tree. Where Satan could not affect man remember now he made Satan and before he created Satan he knew what Satan would do so he could have created Satan in a way where Satan didn't even have the ability to even think that far you ever thought about that when God created Satan he created Satan with everything that Satan had in his mind that's how he created Satan he had Satan he made Satan for a purpose 
So everything that happened in Eden, he wanted. He wanted Adam, the first living soul on earth, to die. And be reborn via devotion to him. Just like Jesus on the cross. Who became separated from God because of our sin. He wanted Adam to be separated from him. That's what death meant in the garden. Separation from God. That's what death meant. It wasn't physical death. Adam still lived to be almost a thousand years old. But immediately he became separated from God in that moment. And when Jesus went to the cross with our sin on him, because of our sin on him, he became separated from the Father. What did he say? Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, as to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had to separate himself from him, from his own son, his only begotten son, because his son had sin. And where sin is, God cannot exist. God does not exist. Sin cannot exist where God is, I should say. That's the power of the blood. It erases sin. It doesn't just forgive it. It erases it so that we can come before the throne of God. Because with sin, we can't come before the throne of God. But Jesus' blood erases sin completely. So that the Bible says God doesn't even remember that you had sin. That's how clean Jesus' blood wipes us. Washes us. So, after the transgression, Adam and Eve both confessed and were forgiven by use of an animal which they received as clothing of mercy. See, when God said he clothed them, he's not talking about, the, when he says that he gave them the, the, the animal skin for their clothing, that's, it doesn't mean physical clothing. It means that he clothed them in mercy because they confessed. Remember, they he approached them. They both they, they both confessed. First John one and nine says, "If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness." They both confessed and were forgiven, and they never committed another sin. How you know that, Brother March? Because there was no more law for them to break. The Bible said, where there is no law, there is no sin. And they were removed from the garden, so they couldn't break that law again. And no law came from God after that, till Moses. Who was thousands of years after Adam. Okay, so God also wanted Adam's sons, us, mankind, to be born as dead souls. And that they could, through knowledge from their father, Adam, learn of their origin and be born again as sons of God also via devotion to that knowledge. Listen, by being conceived with the Holy Spirit just like Jesus, remember? When, when, Jesus, when Jesus, the Word, made Adam, he was made with the Holy Spirit, breathed the Holy Spirit into him, he conceived him with the Holy Spirit. When... Jesus was conceived on earth in Mary. She, he was conceived with the Holy Spirit. Same thing. So by being conceived with the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, Adam would retain the knowledge of who he first was in God again, just like Jesus. Jesus knew who he was from birth. Even though the Holy Spirit did not live in him until he was 30. How do I know that? Remember when they lost him, traveling, and they found him in the temple, Mary and Joseph? What did he say? Did you not know I would be in my father's house? He knew who his father was. He knew Joseph was not his father. And he was 12 years old when that happened. And Adam still had the knowledge that the Holy Spirit gave him 
when the Holy Spirit lived in him, that he was a God. And he passed everything that he knew that had happened to him down. He wrote it down. And that's how Moses got it. Moses wrote from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses wrote those. And he got that, that knowledge from those before him. All them, all them would write. That's why that's how Jesus could say to the Pharisees and scribes, didn't the scripture that you have, the writings that you have, say that you are God? All they see that's one thing I like about those people in the Bible. They wrote, they wrote down stuff. That's why we got this stuff. They wrote it down. They didn't have to recall these things out of, out of, out of thin air. They wrote these things down and passed them down to their children so that they could know who they were. It's a pity we don't do that. Seriously, you know, that I really, when I think about that, I really, I really wish I had wrote, just wrote down my whole life for my son. So he could see all the things I went through and the pitfalls and the way God brought me out. So he could see what to avoid and, and to know about himself. What to avoid. It was, like I say, Moses had the manuscript, not the Holy Spirit. Remember, nobody in, in the Old Testament had the Holy Spirit. None. Because Jesus had to go to the cross for man to have the Holy Spirit after Adam's sin. That's the only way man could have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Living in him. It was always his desire that man choose to be in him, to choose life and good over death and evil. Life and good over death and evil. As a formula to re be reborn as sons. That very thing is what transpired with the Christ. Who was the first believer. In demonstrating how it must happen. It remains God's intent to this very day. This command was given to the Israelites to prove what I just said. But it was given to Adam first. Long before them in the garden. Deuteronomy 30 and 15 says. I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today that I have said before you, life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life in order that you and your descendants may live. Now, notice what it says here. I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today that I, this is God speaking now, I have said before you life and death, the blessing and the curse, good and evil. You know what I just said? You still don't believe God is in control? Good and evil comes from God. Good and evil. Heaven and hell comes from God. Death and life comes from Him. The battle ain't yours. If there's a battle to, for you to fight, it's, it's with you and yourself. Because like Paul says, there's a war going on between his mind and his flesh. So you got to fight with your flesh to do what God says. That's where your war is if there's a war. You and your own flesh. Because the Bible says we lust because of, we sin because of the lust of our own flesh. We could, we could, we could, we could fight it. With Jesus, we can. If we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he, has, he will break the bondage of sin and set us free. Because no man without Jesus can help sin, sinning. It is a bondage, a slavery, a prison that no man can escape. Because we are all born with it, the nature of sin. God gave Adam life in him at his creation as a witness to mankind of what his ultimate existence for man is. Excuse me. Then he orchestrated for him to lose it, even though he never intentionally disobeyed, so that he and all men after via divine knowledge would have to choose to regain it. So God created man, made him a God by giving him this, the life from in him. God took life out of himself and put it in man. 
So man was born a God or created a God, however you want to put it. Jesus said in Romans, I tell you Romans and Psalms 82, 5 to 7, ye are gods, but you will die like men because you don't know you're a God. And then God told him, now there's a tree in here, this garden, if you eat from this tree, the life I put in you to make you a God like me, remember God said in Genesis 1 26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He said, that will die, not your physical life, but that God life that gives you dominion over the earth, the ability to speak things into being. Just like me when I spoke the earth into being, that's in you, that will die. And also you will become separated from me. That's why it will die, because once you separate me from me, once the, 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 the branches are separated from the vine, remember what he told us? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you separate yourself from me, you will die. And that's what happened to Adam. If you disobey God, if you choose to be disobedient to God, you will, you will be separating yourself from God. And so you can receive nothing from God. And not until you receive the antidote for sin, which is Jesus Christ. We separated ourselves from him in Adam, right? Through Adam's transgression. And he came back to earth and gave himself to be reconciled back to with us to bring us back to him he did it himself he gave us life originally himself and he came back after we lost it and gave it back to us off and he offers it back to us why because he is in full control it's all him and his right to do it okay so like I said, we would have to now choose to regain it. They would all have to die, men would all have to die to be reborn and live again. Just like Jesus did on earth in demonstration of what must happen for man to be fully God's again. Same thing. Jesus came to earth as a man, took on our sin. And just how when Adam took on sin, when he disobeyed God, he died. When Jesus took on our sin, he had to die. He went to the cross and he died. Right? And... By faith, he was reborn. Do you understand what I just said? He had to believe. The Bible says he was the first believer. Romans 8 and 29, For those whom the Father foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he, the Son, will be the first among many believers. He was the first believer. You, always, you wonder why Jesus always asks us to believe? Because he was the first. He had to believe in the Father to resurrect him. He couldn't do it himself. He did not have his heavenly power while he was on earth. The only power he used was the power of dominion that he gave to man. And the reason why he was able to use it was because he never sinned. He was the perfect man. He was Adam come again, the second Adam. And that's the only power that he had. And that's the only power that he used. But the father had to authorize him to come out of that grave. And he talked about that. Okay? You got to listen to my teachings. Go. I got many of them on YouTube. Just pull up my name, Sterling March, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G, March, just like the month. And you can watch almost 80 videos with me teaching this stuff. Good stuff. Okay, and I give, I, I have long teachings because I got to go into detail. This is why the tree of good and evil was placed in the garden and why Satan was allowed into Eden. For both to be the instruments of, of man's ultimate transformation. The man had to die. Listen, before a thing can truly live, it has to die. Even a, 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 a seedling from a tree has to die before it can be reborn to, into a tree. It's no different from us. We all came from the earth. Everything that comes from the earth has to die 
in order to be reborn. And it's the same thing with the trees, and it's the same thing with man. Okay? So, like I said, that's why the tree of, of good and evil was placed in the garden, and why Satan was allowed in. For both to be the instruments of, man, instruments of man's ultimate transformation. Once Satan entered the presence of God, knowledge was given to him as to the what and how he could do to cause mankind's demise. God gave him that knowledge. <laughs> Who else he could get it from? The knowledge of what God did with Adam was in God. Only in him. And in those who we allowed to know it. It's just like with you. You only know what you know about God because God has chosen to give you that knowledge. Through his word and through his relationship with you. Listen. Even your faith is a gift from God. You couldn't even believe in God if he didn't give you that ability. The Bible says he gives to every man a measure of faith, a certain measure of faith. You couldn't even have the ability to believe so that you could go to, to the kingdom, inherit the kingdom, if God didn't place that in you. You know why he did that? Because what happened in Eden was a mistake by Adam. That God knew was going to happen because he set it up that way. But he knew that it was unintentional, I should say, on Adam's part. And that's why all men now have the right to become the sons of God again. They just have to find the key. That's all. Find their way to the key, to the door, I should say. Faith is the key. Jesus is the door. If you believe in the door, you can use your key which is your faith, to open the door. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's all. And he gives you the key. He places the key in you. Now it's up to you to develop that key. To grow your faith, to exercise your faith by studying the word, applying it to your life, and to the lives of others, and helping to influence others, because he didn't save you just for you. That's why he said, go into the world and take this message to the world. He placed it in you for you and for others. And if you exercise your faith by putting it to the test and, 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 and standing on it, and whenever situations come at you, tests and trials, you apply the word to them, your faith will grow. And you'll become stronger and stronger and stronger. How strong you become is up to you. Like I said, God will give you as much of him as you can handle. It's up to you. I know what I know because I believe every word that God says. I don't try to manipulate it to mean what I think, what I want it to mean. No. I always say, God, look, God, please don't let me be wrong. Please. For God's sake, I'm teaching. Don't let me be wrong. If I am wrong, stop me. Shut me down. End my ministry. End it. Because I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong. I got too many people listening to me, watching me. You know, I've even, I've even heard now foreign preachers in the United States quoting stuff from me. I'm telling you. I've been sending my stuff out to the, to the United States. I've been paying for them, sponsoring them to go all across the United States. Sometimes I got 15, 16,000 views. All kind, and I'm sure these are people who into the word. So you don't know who's listening to you and who's watching you. But I never heard it said before I said it. Now I'm hearing things that I'm saying. 
And it, I remember it was the same way with I laid past the miles by road. That's why you got to be careful. And you got to know this word. God will use you, you know, if you present yourself to be used. And you allow him to brainwash you rather than other people. I don't allow people to brainwash me no more. Okay? That's a very, very, that's a pitfall you got to avoid. That God, Jesus, God said, I will have no man teach you. But I will write my word on your heart myself. This is in the word. Okay? So, like I said, we see where God used Satan in a similar way with Job. Remember? Satan was, is, and will always be a tool of God. You think God doesn't do things sometimes that we don't understand? You see how he allowed he allows Satan to basically, I mean, do everything but kill Job. He, Satan asked him for permission. God said, go ahead, just don't kill him. Don't kill him. He's mine. Don't kill him. But he can handle that. So, that's why I tell you, don't, 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 don't worry about what you're going through. Keep remember, just remember. Job. And then at the end, Job passed the test and God restored him. How many times? Seven times? Would he have? Before? Well, listen, man. God is in full control. Hey, he may use you for another test. Satan may ask for you. Remember what God, what Jesus told Peter? He said, Peter, Satan is asking me to sift, for, for, asking for me to let you sift him like wheat. Sift you like wheat. Satan wanted to do the same thing with Peter that he did to Job. But Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. I've covered you. Because he know Peter couldn't handle that. Remember Peter denied him? My God. If, 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 if Satan had done to him what he did to Job, my God. If he denied Jesus who he walked with. Whew. The free will devotion of man toward God will create a bond between father and son that can never be broken. No man in Christ would ever intentionally disobey God, which Adam never did. You see, that's what God is trying is, is, is trying to do. It's not trying. It's, that's what God wants to achieve. That's what he wants us to achieve in him, I should say. You see? That's why he did that to Adam, so that we could be all born dead. And the Bible tells us that we were all dead. When Adam died, mankind died. We are the walking dead. Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees and scribes? He said, you are all whitewashed sepulchers, which is a like a mausoleum, a, 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 a dead, a tomb. He said, you are all whitewashed sepul sepulchers carrying around the bones of dead men. And listen, that was not something unique to them. He, all men were that who were on the earth at the time. All men were dead. That's why the life bringer came to make those who would receive him alive again. They were dead. He wasn't trying to insult them. He was just giving them the truth that all men are dead. Okay, and so God wanted Adam to die because he didn't. Want, he, he he gave Adam the gift, right? But he also gave the gift to Satan, and Satan, because of a lack of devotion, lost the gift, corrupted himself, thought too much of himself because of the power. He didn't. He didn't. He wasn't devoted to it. He wasn't devoted to God. And so he allowed it to overcome him because he wanted to be like, you know, sit on the mountain of God. But he ended up falling to earth 
getting thrown to earth because of it. So God said, okay, I've seen what could happen when I give this power to someone and they're not devoted. So I'm not going to let this happen to Adam. I'm going to just give it to him long enough for him to know what he could be. I'll take it from him. And now, him and his descendants could regain it. I'll give them the knowledge of how they could regain it. And I will come to earth and make it possible for them to have it. And if they receive me, they can have this power back again. They can't be reborn. And now, because they will have come to me of their own free will that I placed in them, they, will, they can never be separated from me. You know why? Because once you do something of your own free will because you want to, nobody can remove you from that. When we want something, when we were to devote ourselves to something because that's what we want for ourselves, nobody can remove us from that. We've made up our minds for life. That's it. This is who I am. This is what I want. I can't be separated from this. I did this by my own choice. Like I said, Adam did not intentionally disobey God. He made an error. He allowed his wife to lead him. And God chastised him for that. Why did you listen to your wife? That's all God said to him. He never cursed him. Because he knew he made a mistake. And guess what? Because Adam, what Adam did was a mistake, is why you and I can be saved. That's why you and I can be saved. Because it was an error. And from then till now, all men sin unintentionally. As a matter of fact, the only man that can sin now intentionally is the man who was saved. That's the only one. And the Bible says, let that man know that he cannot return. Because if I give you my Holy Spirit, God is saying, and you still intentionally disobey me, then there's no point in me bringing you back to me. And that's why he, he, he could redeem Adam, because Adam did not intentionally disobey him. Adam just made an error. And God chastised him as with sons, the Bible says. But God demonstrated through his first son, Jesus, who, was, who as the first believer proved his devotion to the Father by coming to earth to die as a man, trusting in his Father to restore him, and was reborn fully as God after death. Adam was the example of this process, having received life in God like the Word, then dying because of sin like him, Jesus, and being restored by God after confessing his mistake, and made atonement for the death of an animal. That's why God killed that animal for Adam and Eve. Because they confessed. Jesus, Jesus was God's own lamb. Adam will later be brought back to full Godship and life because of the Christ sacrifice on the cross and will be in God's kingdom on his return. See, when God killed that animal for Adam and Eve, they could receive atonement, but they couldn't receive salvation. The only way for them to receive salvation is through Jesus. But because Jesus went to the cross, Adam can receive salvation. So on that day, Adam will be right there with us, those of us who are in Christ, because he confessed and he was forgiven. And he never broke another law. So he died being forgiven and not having committed another sin. I'm not saying he didn't do bad things, but he didn't sin. God is only concerned about sin. That's what God is concerned about. We all, listen, we all do bad things. But God forgives us through Jesus Christ who forgives our sin. And who died to wash away our sin. Not our bad things. Because we all do bad things. Some of us won't go to hell though because of Jesus 
Adam was able to be forgiven because he never acted against or blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He never did. Who lived in him but made a mistake in listening to his wife, not fully understanding who he was, which he was chastised for. See, I always get ahead of myself and end up repeating. Listen, even Holy Ghost filled people still are learning to do and make mistakes. That was Adam. Even though he had the Holy Spirit, he made a mistake. Don't be, don't be as believers still make mistakes with the Holy Spirit living in us. That's why Jesus said, I'll forgive you as much times as you need it. Because I know you're human. You're still in that flesh, that corrupted flesh. And that's why I'll give you a new body one day. Because as long as you're in that flesh, you're going to do wrong. He was able to be forgiven also. Because, listen to this now. Because without the Holy Spirit to strengthen her, she was weaker than her husband. That's why Satan could do what he did with her. And also ignorant to evil making her sin forgivable though punishable god didn't punish adam but he did punish eve okay i explain something to you in a moment because though she wasn't aware of evil she was aware of the command not to eat remember now she was created she when god gave adam that command not to eat she wasn't even created yet but adam told her that's why she had that conversation with Satan. She learned it from her husband. She was supposed to go back to her husband when the serpent approached her, but she didn't. God would purposely create her without his spirit in her to cause the whole Eden event to occur for man's conversion to full godliness. That's why he made her weaker. Because he needed someone to listen to fall prey to Satan. He wanted man to die. This was God acknowledging that the man in him would never disobey intentionally. Adam never disobeyed intentionally. That's why he was not cursed. The ground became cursed. Because I know some of you are saying, yeah, but he was cursed because the ground became cursed. No, yes, the ground became cursed, not him. The ground became cursed because when he died, he, sep he was separated from God. He was separated from his dominion. That means now that he can't command the earth anymore. He has to go to the earth with his hands to work. That's what God means when he said the ground is now cursed. He can't speak. Listen, Adam, was, Adam could have speak to the wind and tell the wind to pick him up. He could fly if he wanted to. He had dominion. Just like Jesus, didn't Jesus rise and go to heaven? As a flesh and blood body? In a flesh and blood body? God in a man? Well, Adam was God in a man. He did it that way. Like I said, because of what occurred in heaven with Satan and his angels. I told you all, all about that. They too were princes of God having the choice to be believers or sinners. Satan could have chosen to remain devoted to God like Jesus. But Satan chose the other way. Jesus told us that we are fallen gods just like Satan. Remember, I told you all about Romans, I'm sorry, Psalms 82, 5-7. He told us to be a fallen God just like Satan and his angels, but unlike him, can be restored to Godship just like him, like Jesus, by choosing to be. That's all. He, he chose righteousness. Satan and his angels chose the opposite. The rest, as they say, is history. This is what he said about man and Satan. Psalm 82, 5 to 7. I can tell you, read this scripture for you right now, but I keep mentioning. He said, Psalm 82, 5 to 7. Listen carefully. He's talking about man. They know not, I'm talking about you, neither do they understand. They walk on in darkness. He was saying this to King David, prophesying to King David, he said. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. That's when the earth became cursed. That's what he was talking about. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Okay? 
I said, you are God. So because you don't know, you can die like a man. Now, if you can die like a man, that means you're not a man. You are God. You're still a God. Right now? Yes, you are still a God. The problem is, you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you to tell you how to manifest that. Without the Holy Spirit, it's just like you're not. You're dead. In order for you to have the power of a God, you have to be alive again. That's why Jesus came to earth to show us how to be gods again and demonstrated the attributes of dominion. And tell us, like, he said, where's your faith? How long? I have to be with you. When are you going to develop your faith? When are you going to believe? This is you. I'm showing you you. This is you. I'm doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be, supposed to be able to speak to the wind and the waves. You're scared of the sea and the sea waiting for you. That's the power that Adam had and he, thought, he was telling them, see, I brought it back for you. You are God's. But until I get this Holy Spirit back in you, and see, he needed them to develop their faith, to start believing before he could put the Holy Spirit back in them. The Bible says this about the Father's desire for us to be like Jesus. Romans 8 and 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he, the Son, would be the firstborn among many believers. That's all. Jesus was simply the first of us. The first of us. That's all. He was a son. He said, if you believe in me, I will also make you sons. Just like I originally created you to be in Adam. Adam was the first earthly son of God. Jesus demonstrated by faith and works that he trusted in the Father. Satan did not. They both have the same free will and choice. This is why God demands our devotion. He will never give himself to someone who will not dedicate themselves to him through study, faith, and obedience. In other words, relationship. He's in full control. And he was in control of the Israelites' situation too. All through that wilderness. But he wasn't doing with them what we thought he was doing. He was displaying what ungodliness looks like to the Israelites. Now with the book of Exodus, all the way to Malachi, we see where mankind would stumble mightily without the Spirit of God living in him. But this is how men became. God was showing us how men would become. How men became, I should say, after Adam. During the time of Noah, the evil angels are children by women, and these were the architects of much evil in the earth. Jerson 6 and 4 says there were Nephilim, giants, on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to their children. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. That's Goliath and them. Verse 5, the law saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination or intent, or intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. This is, why, this is how men became without God when they separated. God was showing us not only through the Philistines but also through the Israelites how wicked men would be without him in living in them even though he was with them but because he wasn't in them they were still wicked. The Bible says he, he regretted creating man at that point and decided to destroy mankind but for Noah and his family. After Noah, he began his plan of restoration with his descent, Abraham, whom he made a covenant with to return man to him. You know, this, this statement that he regretted creating man. I don't know if that's the right, right word they're using in that translation. Because I don't think God regrets. Okay? I, I don't think God regrets. If you already know what you, what's going to happen, why would you regret it? That's not the right, correct word. See, these translations, you've got to be careful with these translations. Remember the, the book, the, the, the Bible was originally written in a different language. So when they converted it to English, you know, that, that became a problem. Okay, so we got to be careful of these. I, can't, I, I don't think God exper uh, um, experiences regret. I, I, I don't believe that at all. Okay? 
After Noah, he began his plan of restoration with his descendant Abraham, whom he made a covenant with to return man to him. He would re attack religiosity in the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, by showing through them how a form of godliness could never avail man of a true status in him. The Israelites being religiously devoted towards the false gods they became enamored with through the Egyptians they had escaped from. God brought them out of Egypt, but they brought Egyptian idolatry with them. <laughs> like they say, you can escape a location, but escaping a mindset is a different matter altogether. Remember they say, that's the Bahamian song, you can take the man out of the island, but you can't take the island out of the man. That's what happened to them. The entire time they led, he led them through the wilderness, and even after, he was displaying as a witness how mankind must never be toward him. And the aforementioned program he started with Abraham, he would not pursue in them because of their misguided faith. He started a program of bringing, returning men to him, you know. The, the, the same covenant that Jesus Christ brought us is the same one that God placed in Abraham. He wanted to do it from then. But first he wanted to show us how wicked man would be. And these people he chose, he chose them to display wickedness. We, we got this thing completely mixed, messed up and mixed up. We think the Israelites were chosen because they were some uh, example for us to follow. They were not at all. He, yes, he came through them, the earth. That's the people he chose. Remember now, God chooses people no matter, even though they do wickedness, he still chooses them. Remember David? Okay. But this is what he said, first he through the prophet Jeremiah, who he had sent to the potter's house to observe him at brick as an example of what he would do with Israel. Jeremiah 18, 5 to 6 and, 11, and verse 11 says this. Then the word of, Lord, word of the Lord came to me, verse 6, O house of Israel. Can I, can I not do with you as this potter does? Says the Lord. Look carefully as the clay in the potter's at the clay in the potter's as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. He was saying, Look here, you are clay in my hand. If I want to throw you in the fire, I can throw you in the fire if I want to. That's my that's my business. That's my right. So I'm going. I I I have you. To use you for my purpose, which is to show the world what men look like when they don't have me living in them, even though they have a form of godliness, but they don't really have me. So I'm with them, but I'm not in, in them. So they practice in religiosity. So I can't place myself in them because they don't, they still worship in idols. So he said, look, as you are, you are like clay in my hand. I can use you for what I want to. He said in verse 11. Now then, say to the men of Judah and the citizens of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, listen, Behold, I am shaping a disaster and working on a plan against you. And change your actions for the better. Then he spoke it again through Paul the Apostle in the New Testament. Now that's the Old Testament. Listen to what he said about them again in the New Testament. They hadn't changed. Romans 9 and 21, he said, Does the Paul not have the right over the clay? To make from the same lump one object for honorable use, that was the be believing Jews, who was only a tiny remnant, and the Gentiles, and another, the idolatrous Jews, the Pharisees and scribes, for common use. See, at that point, the Pharisees and scribes weren't worshipping idols, physical idols. They were worshipping religious, religion. They were religious. They were following scriptures, but it didn't make the, the, the change that the scripture told them to make. And God told them, I'm going to do a new thing. They, they, they didn't follow that. They couldn't receive that because when Jesus Christ came, they didn't believe it was him. They couldn't receive him, even though he did everything and was everything the Bible said he would be. And everything happened to him exactly as their scriptures prophesied. That's the crazy thing about it. Verse 22, what if God? Although willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, has tolerated with great patience the objects of his wrath 
prepared for destruction. He was talking about the Israelites. He said, I've tolerated these people for a long time just so I could show them, my show the world my wrath. And to show how I destroy people that do the things that they do. And that is practice idolatry. He says in verse 23, And what if he has done so? To make known the riches of his glory to the objects of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. He's talking about believers. He's saying, what if he did that to the Israelites so that he could show to those who would receive him mercy? Verse 24, including those, including us, whom he also called not only from among the Jews, from among the Jews, now not the Jews, from among the Jews, because most of them didn't make it, still ain't making it, but also among the Gentiles. The Bible tells us there's only a few. I can tell you, I can, I can read some more. Many have misunderstood that the lesson God has given through the Israelites is that they are to be a people to be admired, when in fact, he was stating exactly the opposite and would eventually discontinue his fellowship with them for a time to pursue the Gentiles who have more readily received him than his own chosen people. <laughs> and that's the same case as to this very day. They, they right now in Israel proposing a law that stops anyone from teaching Jesus in Israel. That's what they're doing in Israel right now, 2023. This is what it says in Matthew 20, 15 to 16. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? This is God saying, hey, I own y'all. I can do what I want. That's why I tell you all, God is in control. Don't question him. Is thine own eye for evil because I am good? The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. For many shall be called, but few chosen. He was saying, but talking about the Israelites again. He was saying, look, this and this was this was this is from a parable that he gave about the men that he hired to work in his vineyard. See, he was talking about himself right here. He was saying to the Israelites, I gave myself to you all first. And I offered you all my kingdom. But now you're all upset because I'm offering my kingdom to these Gentiles who just came to know me, just coming to know me now. He say, excuse me, this is my kingdom. Don't I have the right to give it to who I want to give it to? He said, that's why the first should be last and the last should be first. You all who I gave myself to first going to be the last to get it. And that's only if you change your unbelief. This is in the Word. See, right now, I'm going after the Gentiles, and I'm going to get all my Gentiles first. Then I'm going to look at you all again. And then, you all better have changed your unbelief. Well, right now, to this day, they still don't believe in Jesus, the nation of Israel. There's a few, a remnant, small amount of people who do 2% of Israel today are Christians. 2%. So I don't know why everybody admiring the Jews. For what? They haven't given us a reason to admire them. Because Jesus come out of them. Jesus could have come through anybody he wanted to. If he, if he chose to come through them. To show, to show as a witness against them. The scripture that says. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But the lesson was completed for all to see. The Israelites as a nation failed to find their way to salvation because of religiosity. God did not fail, but accomplished exactly what he desired for our edification. He, did, he used the Israelites for us. I tell you, he's in full control. He used the Israelites to show us what not to do. Romans 9 verse 27 says, And Isaiah himself calls out concerning Israel. And he said this long before the New Testament. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, 
It is only a remnant that will be saved. Only a tiny, small, tiny amount of Israelites will be saved. And that's the ones who are break, broken free from that religious, that religious religion called Judaism that only studies the Old Testament. They thought they could achieve God by ritualism, as most modern religious folk believe to this day. They refused to die to the religious mindset they brought out of Egypt. They never released themselves from that, freed themselves from that, and thus could not be reborn into salvation to this very day. From day one, God has been controlling this world manipulating leaderships and initiatives to cause mankind to come to him of their own volition. Colossians 1 and 16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, listen, or rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him and for him. You hear that? You know how serious that is? Do you know how many wicked rulers and authorities they have been since the creation of this world. And the Bible say all of them are created and exist through him for him and for him. I tell you all, good and evil comes from God. He uses them both for his purpose. What did he say to the Israelites? I see, I have said before you this day, life and good and death and evil. You choose. You choose. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, David, Caesar, Herod, the Romans, Hitler, Genghis Khan, Putin, Penland, Ingram, Christie, Menace Davis, those four last five were the prime ministers of the Bahamas. All rulers worldwide have been put in place by God for his purpose. God put all of them in place for a reason. Don't question why things happen when it comes to rulers and dominions and authorities. Yes, even Hitler himself, God put him in place. And he killed six million Jews. Now, I know there are many Jews who may hear this teaching and hate me. But the Bible says this in Colossians, that they were all created and exist through him and for him. Excuse me. See, for those who would question whether God did put Hitler in place and allow them to kill all them Jews, his people, well, didn't God put Nebuchadnezzar in position and went into his mind and had him attack the Jews and carved them off right back into slavery and killed many of them the same way? Study history. The history in the Bible. He has time and time again assured us through his promises that the world exists for him and everything and everyone has a purpose. Who else can command circumstances even in the future to bless us when we arrive? Romans 8 28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. Who but him can proclaim inevitable blessing upon man? simply for his faith and obedience. Matthew 6, 31 to 33 says, Therefore do not worry or be anxious, saying, What are we going to eat, or what are we going to drink, or what are we going to wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. But do not worry, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you also. Blessings that most humans struggle through their entire existence to achieve. He gives by proclamation. And no one can stop him. He's in control. Psalm 37, 4 to 5 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and petitions of your heart. He says, look here, you, all you have to do is please me, you know. Stop worrying about people. Stop worrying about your job, your, your boss on your job. 
Stop worrying about your, your, your political leader. Stop worrying about your pastor. Pleasing him. He said, please me. Me. Because me and them ain't always on one accord. You make sure you do what I have desired. And I will give you your desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5. Trust in him also and he will do it. Only God can and only God does. Like he say, it was, his, it was and is his desire for man to die to his natural self and be reborn to him as supernatural sons of God. He has given knowledge of how that can happen, but we are not listening. Since Adam who died in his soul, all men are born dead automatically and creating the necessity for them to be born over from death through the Christ if they are to be alive again as Adam was at his creation. Jesus said in John 11 and 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. As stated before, he wasn't speaking of physical death, but death of the breath of life in man's soul. He can give it back to you, he said, by Adam's sin, which God orchestrated for his purpose. For his pleasure, all things happen for the directing of man to understand why and how he must pursue God. Must! There's no getting away from him. No! But to perish, there is no other alternative. How are you going to get away from God? When he controls everything. Either for him or against him, it will always be our choice. But he controls the choices and the inevitable result of our choices. He gives us the choice. He say, I have said before you life and good and death and evil. The blessing and the curse, you choose. Choose life. He tells us. Listen. The only reason he allows, there are only two, like I said, life and good or death and evil. Everything else is just vanity, according to King Solomon. Say them, so King Solomon tell us, you know. All these things is just vanity. God in control anyway, so you might as well go with him. Because at the end of the day, after all of that, you still got to come back to him. And then be judged. Because you didn't live the life. Well, all of us can be judged, but you can be judged according to the life that you live. So even if you live a wealthy life, boy, that's a short, wealthy life. 70 years ain't nothing. It could be 80, 90, that's still short. I can't believe I'm 60 this year. Wow. The only reason, like I say, they are all vanity, according to King Solomon, things that take up too much, too much of our time away from God. The only reason he allows them to exist, to assist us in our decision. He only allows them to assist us in our decision, not to control our lives. More importantly, though, his word to his word, he also provides us with as much counsel as we can handle. Like I said, choose life, he says. Choose me and be made whole, alive in me again. If any, everyone would follow his advice, no one would fail. Listen, not one single person would fail at anything if they followed God. Not one. Not one. There's no man on this earth who can say they did everything that God said and it still and it failed. No, not one. How? He created everything to serve him. It came out of him. He spoke it. It came out of his breath. So it functions according to the way he wants it to function. And he said, look here. Let me give you the keys. Follow these keys. Follow these instructions. I'm the manufacturer. Just do things as I say. And this product will always work for you. We ain't listening. He says, choose me and be made whole, alive in me again. If everyone follows advice, like I say, no one would fail. This is the only choice that is worth making because whether or not we understand it, God orchestrates success in life for those who receive him. It's that simple. He is always in control. 
Don't let nobody fool you, yeah? And don't let life fool you. You may enjoy life for a time. You may get rich and then die and not even be able to appreciate your risk. You remember Steve Jobs? Multi billionaire, computer guy. Died at the age of 51, I think it was. Couldn't even enjoy his money. One of the richest men on earth. But guess what? God could have healed him, you know. God could have healed him if he wanted to. If he wasn't, maybe if he wasn't the purpose that God gave for, for all men, and that is that we be examples of him. That we show the world how to be righteous. That we teach. Maybe if he was about that, he may still be alive today. And with all that money he had, he could have used that as a platform or as a resource to travel the world and teach. Sickness ain't no problem for God. But many of us will not live to see the money we've earned or gotten because of sickness. Many of us, our marriages are struggling because we refuse to conduct ourselves the way the word says. Husbands not loving their wives, wives not submitting to their husbands. Many children have died young. See all these, see all these young people dying? Because they disobeyed their parents. This is the word. Many people, listen, you know why many, many of the poor exist? Listen, there is absolutely no reason for the poor to exist, you know. Listen, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and everything you need will be added to your life. It's, just, it's that simple. The poor exist because they won't Find out what God says and do it. There is no reason for the poor to exist. But even then, because he knows they will exist, he even uses them for his purpose. To be as a witness against rich people. That's why he says it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go to the eye of a needle. Because he, what he's saying is, with all the poor that is around you, when you're rich, and you won't even do nothing with all that money to help those poor people that you know exist right in your country. Not that that will get you into the kingdom now, but that's a part of it. That shows love. You still have to receive Jesus Christ. But there are many rich people who say they know God and say they love God, but they don't know nothing for the poor. Or they just do just a little, just to say they do something. They carry on like Oprah. You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. Well, why don't you, how about you go and do some other things for them? There are some there are countries in, in Africa and other parts of the world that don't even have water. You could use those billions to, to build irrigation for their crops, water supply, build houses, all kinds of things. All kinds of things. There are things we can do for God. Find out what it is that you can do for Him. And when He says, when you do for others, you do for me. Because at the end of the day, you still got to come back to me. And I will tell you how you measure it up. What is the conclusion of your life? And whether or not you can live again. So, that brings us to the end of another teaching. And I'll end by saying to you, those of you who haven't received Jesus Christ as Lord, you need to receive him. 
like I said, there's a lot of information in my teachings. Look me up on YouTube. Listen. Watch and listen. Learn of Him. A lot of knowledge. Give your life to Him. Once, as you learn, devote yourself to Him. I've given a lot of counsel from Him on what you must do. Don't stay the same way. If you have the knowledge, you can't remain the same. You got to change. Are you willing to change? Do it today. Give Jesus your life. Let him change you. Let him welcome you into his kingdom that day. Okay? I'll see you on Sunday. God bless you. Have a beautiful day. Be careful out there. I love you all. Take care. Bye-bye.